Welcome to this webinar. My name is Cristina and I'm part of the EcoSurveys team, an organization that is uh, that worked on energy efficiency, renewable energy and climate change. We are leading a project um, called Playgreen that is co-founded by the Erasmus Plus program. And uh, today uh, we're doing this webinar on a sports environment that this is this is going to belong to a toolkit on how to green a sport event with volunteers, with young volunteers. If you want more information, you can um, you can uh, email us at playgreenproject uh, at ecosurveys.net. Um, all this information that is here is going to be sent uh, <clears throat> to you if you register to the uh, to the event. And if not, you can email us and we can tell you where you can find the information. So uh, yeah, let's start. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, the current state of the environment. Then I'm gonna move into the role of sports in the environment. And then we're gonna see some tools and finally some examples of clubs. There are many examples. Uh, I just uh, showed you some and on your own time, I gave you references so you can check as well. So this is for uh, people that uh, have heard about climate change, that they know there is an environmental crisis, but uh, actually they <clears throat> don't know specifically uh, the, the big framework uh, of what is happening. So <clears throat> in short, um, what's our relationship with the environment? So as you, <clears throat> as you may know, we have natural resources and they affect the, the uh, socioeconomic system. And then uh, this produces some environmental externalities. By using resources in our ecosystem, uh, uh, we produce environmental externalities. This, of course, affects our natural resources. But how? Um, let's make an example, right? So we have oil and gas, um, and then we use it for energy in our houses, transport, and as we know, we, this produces CO2, among other uh, externalities, it, it produces CO2. This affects the climate change, which affects our natural resources as well. So um, what happens is that we are using more than the planet has time to regenerate. And the ecosystems, uh, the socioeconomic system is, is greedy. <laughs> we are valuing money before, uh, before um, sustainability. And the environment and we're using more than we than we can and this has a repercussion and specifically scientists say that they're it's affecting in planetary what they call planetary boundaries there are nine and they reflect uh, the ones so this graph uh, reflects what is more in danger and what what uh, boundaries we have crossed as you see uh, biodiversity loss nitrogen cycle uh, are the ones that we are um, exceeding more, but um, climate change as well, and climate change is <clears throat> the uh, the boundary that everyone talks about. And um, why? Like, if there are others, why why is this this important? Um, so, climate the, the climate change is uh, kind of the key uh, to other environmental externalities as well, uh, as you can. See in this graph, uh, we go from uh, 400,000 years uh, until um, the Industrial Revolution, would say. Uh, before the Industrial Revolution, the CO2 emissions in the atmosphere, the concentration, sorry, were more or less the same. They were variables, but they were more or less the same. But then we have a peak, um, and this started in the Industrial Revolution, but then it, it, it peaked uh, at the 1950s. And then at uh, the current level, <clears throat> um, it exceeds uh, the 400 parts per million, which is, has never been seen. This concentration is uh, correlated with a, a temperature increase, but this correlation is also casual. Like um, So uh, the correlation means ca causali causality. And <clears throat> um, we know that this CO2 is produced by, by, human, by, by the human activity. If we continue the same way that, that we are uh, using the resources, um, what's going to happen 
is that we are going to see a warming of 4 degrees. Now we are in 1 degree and we already see things happening. Uh, um, more droughts, more fires, and uh, the, ice, uh, the ice is melting in a faster rate than actually was... Um, it was um, um, regarded or thought it would by the IPCC, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change. But so we, what we want to do is, is, is decrease this into uh, a, a lo lower emission rate. So, well, how we do that? is kind of the question, right? There are many ways to do it, but the, the, the most important concept is that we cannot grow, inf infinitely grow on a finite planet. So, okay, I like this. I, I read a book um, by Jim Merkel in 2000. Well, he wrote this in 2003. And he said, um, okay, imagine that you're in a first line at a potluck buffet. Uh, the spread includes not just food and water, but all the materials needed for shelter, clothing, healthcare, and education. How do you know how much is to take? How much is enough to leave for your neighbors behind you? Not just the 6 billion people, now it's more than 6 billion, um, but the wildlife and the as yet unborn. So that's the key question. Uh, how much can we use of the natural resources? Um, so to know that, we need to manage, like to, to know how to manage the resources. We, we cannot, and, and to manage them, we, we need to measure them. So in that sense, we cannot manage what we can't measure. And that's why uh, we have what it's called the ecological footprint. So what's the ecological footprint? Uh, here you can press and there's a video in your own time, you can check it if you want to know more. But basically, the ecological footprint measures how fast we consume resources and generate waste. Uh, the Earth has uh, 12 billion hectares of biological productive land and water. And dividing this by the number of people alive, uh, said billion, 7 billion, uh, it gives a total global hectare of 1.72% uh, sorry, 1.72 uh, per person. If everyone has an ecological footprint of 1.72 global hectares, we are safe. So keep this in mind, 1.72 glo global hectares per person. That means that everyone on Earth, if we all have these 1.72 global hectares, we are safe. We are in our, within our limits. So I'm going to tell you how many uh, global hectares I <laughs> use and uh, of course, I will encourage you to, to do the same. So I use 2.6, so more than I should, uh, even if I'm a uh, vegetarian, sometimes vegan, and well, now I fly more than I should. But um, <clears throat> so it's 2.6, and that means that if everyone on the earth used the same resources that I do, we would need 1.5 earths. So yeah, not many Christina should be in the world. But um, what is important here is that the major part is <clears throat> carbon footprint. So the carbon footprint accounts for most of the ecological footprint. That's why a lot of people only measure the carbon footprint and not the whole uh, ecological footprint. But uh, I like the ecological footprint because it's more inclusive. So here you can check it in your own time. I bet you that yours is going to be bigger than mine. Let's see. <laughs> um, so we have, um, as I said, yeah, uh, yeah, currently, so you, I told you that um, <clears throat> if everyone would use my res the same resources as I do, we would need 1.5. But actually, humanity today is using the, the equivalent of 1.7 Earths. Um, so... That's more. So people use, in average, uh, of course, there's people that use m much less and people that use much more. And this is linked to uh, economic poverty and economic, uh, I would say, waste of resources, I guess. While people that are very rich tend to uh, spend and, and, and use more resources, right? So uh, oh, here you can have uh, another uh, footprint calculator that is only for, for carbon, if you want to. 
So, okay, we, we have seen uh, what's our role with the environment. Then we go to, okay, what has the sports to do with this, right? Now what, that we know uh, the ecological footprint, and we might ask why sports matter and why, what's the role of, of, of sports into this? Okay, well, um, you can ask what's the ecological footprint of a sport event. Following with the idea of the ecological footprint, there's a, a really nice academic paper, actually. Um, I'm a little bit of a nerd with uh, academic papers, so I like reading them a lot. And uh, it said that um, the total impact of the uh, 2004 FA Cup final was eight times greater than the average each person would normally spend. So that means that uh, Christina, for, for me, uh, the day I go to a sport event, uh, if I would have been into this sport event, my ecological footprint that day would be eight times bigger than my normal day. Um, the results are here. So, so mainly uh, visitors uh, spent on uh, uh, travel, like the, the ecological footprint mainly accounted for travel, food and drink consumption, the infrastructure, uh, the stadium infrastructure, um, and waste. Here, I mean, you can look in more, more in detail after, but to me, the big, the big take intake from here is that there were uh, 0 0.06 or 0 0.07 uh, global lectures per visitor. And what does this mean? So, if that's for one day, and they, they, the year has 350 uh, days, that means that, um, um, well, and if one global actor is 1.7 planets, we would need over 18 planets if everyone in the world would go to a sport event like the, fin the, th the 2004 Final Cup. So if this was to happen, um, um, we would need over over 18 planets. Of course, no one, I mean, we don't all go to these events every day, but it's to put things into perspective. <laughs> so why can sports be the key? Well, on the one hand, we know that there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, we know that we can reduce our ecological footprint a lot. So that's key um and then ah uh, that is a uh, really a uh, really nice quote from greta that made me think uh because she said i hope well you probably know who greta Thunberg is uh, she's a climate activist and and she said that if a football game gets more media attention than the climate crisis how are people going to know there is a climate crisis so this takes us into the second opportunity we have an opportunity to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 emissions, but we also have an opportunity to tell people that the climate crisis is important. Uh, if you still don't know her, uh, I recommend you clicking into this video and uh, <laughs> you, you will get to know her uh, speech uh, narrative. So, uh, as I was saying, sports reach all members of society. It connects everyone regardless their background, and sporting events offer an amazing platform to distribute a message as important as climate change. And actually, the sports industry is doing many things. Uh, they are uh, educating millions of fans, protecting the environment, and they're showing their uh, many fans uh, cost-effective solutions uh, for our planet. So what are they doing uh, and what tools we we have so okay it's we have seen that the environment is in a crisis that sports can do things to tackle this especially to uh, communicate about it and reduce climate uh, well co2 emissions but what tools do we have to do it okay so there are international mechanisms as you may know there's the un uh, they have the uh, um, Sustainable Development Goals, now a lot of people talk about them. They are not only environmental, but they are also social, but they are some that are uh, environmental. 13 is climate action, um, 
and then we have live uh, sorry alive below water uh, Greenland so um, we have this uh, framework they, specifically in sports they produced uh, the handbook to help sport organizations to be in line with the sustainable development goals and specifically for climate change there's the uh, global climate action and there are two <clears throat> two different uh, goals. The first goal is achieving a clear trajectory for the global sports community to go to combat climate change. And the second goal they, they have is using a sports as a unifying tool. Um, you, can, uh, you can join uh, the Global Climate Action uh, for the sports. You can see the link here uh, if you want to and uh, you can see their principles but I, I put them here uh, so you can see that they are not um, as um, difficult sorry uh, they are not as difficult as one may think so <clears throat> people who join these uh, principles are organizations, well, organizations that, that, that join them are those that undertake systematic effort to promote greater environmental responsibility, reduce overall climate impact, educate for climate action, promote sustainable and responsible consumption, and advocate for climate action through communication. So if you do this or you plan to do this, you can contact them or you can tell us and we can put you in touch with them because we have been communicating with, with the UN um, Global Climate Action. So this is on the international governance, as I said. And then there are private certificates that uh, you can <clears throat> go through them. These are, <clears throat> you need to pay <clears throat> for them, but they are well regarded to, to have a certification. They also follow the Sustainable Development Goals some of them at least and uh, it's an independent non-governmental organization and, and it has 164 national standard bodies um, you can check it in your own time as well it's just for you to know that this exists and, and you can use it and at the same time <clears throat> for for buildings we have the LEED certification and you can also check it in your own time, but basically it's to certify that a building is energy and environmentally uh, sustainable. There are many other toolkits and resources. I left you some here, but if you have a specific questions, as I said, you can uh, email us. So finally, we talked about the environment. Uh, we're in crisis. Then we talked about... Um, the ecological footprint of sport events and, and that they they could be sports can be a platform to communicate climate change and at the same time <clears throat> they can be a there is an opportunity opportunity to decrease uh, global emissions uh, and then we took a quick look at uh, certifications and, and and possible tools in a big picture and then well what are sport organizations doing? Uh, there are many examples, but actually we can divide them in three. Um, three places where it happens and two ways it's done. So it happens at the events. So there's sustainable events, stadiums, and then sports clubs that are overall doing uh, an effort in global to promote or to be more sustainable there are two things they do actions to reduce consumption as i said and communication and dissemination so for sustainability sustainability in, in events there are four uh, main organizations uh sorry uh events and they well they are the olympic paralympic games they are the international Olympic Committee, there is the UEFA European Championship and the Women's World Cup uh, 2019. I'm sure there are many more, but these are the ones we picked. Um, and it's very interesting because they mostly all focus on on the same categories as we will see, 
So for instance, the Olympic and Paralympic Games fo focused on food, using uh, sustainably sourced food, limiting materials, and transport, making effort to decrease the use of heavy vehicles. Uh, the International Olympic Committee focused on energy infrastructure, resources, transport for staff and members, workforce to promote healthy lifestyle and compensating emissions. Compensating emissions is a big thing, a big topic uh, that requires a complete new uh, webinar <laughs> by, because there are pros but else there are also many cons. The UEFA European Championship, they focused on transport, again, waste management, energy and water optimization. And then what's very interesting on procurement. That means that uh, checking if uh, the products they were using were sustainable. And then the Women's World Cup, uh, this is new, like uh, not, not many organizations that I know of do it, um, or events, sorry. But they focused on respecting all the, enviro the natural environment uh, around the, the sport, <clears throat> the sport event. Then waste management, and then in transport and energy as well. And they use the ISO uh, 20121 <laughs> um, of sustainable events that we have seen before. There are, as I said, others you can check on your own time. Um, and if we take a look at what they focus on, uh, they focus on transport. I changed the N and the S to go the other way around. Transport, energy, water, procurement. Uh, these are the things that are most um, mostly uh, a sport events most focus on to reduce carbon emissions and tackle climate change. Here you have uh, some examples. So um, the transport. I mean, a lot of organizations, what they did is encourage public transport because private uh, transport accounts for a lot of CO2 emissions. And then walking. And they partnered, that's interesting, because they partnered with uh, National Railways and, com and company, yeah, railway company, and make more trains available for the match day. So that's a good idea if you want to uh, promote sustainable sports events. And then regarding energy, uh, limit the use of energy by increasing on energy efficiency practices. Um, that can be switching off the lights. Uh, I mean, like, th there are small things that, that can make huge differences. Um, then water, limit the water usage and uh, define a stadium water management policy. As you can see, this is linked also to the stadium, not only the event, but there are things that uh, are part of the event management, like sustainable management of the events, but they are linked with the uh, stadium management. Res resources lose, uh, use less unnecessary resources, procurement responsibility, responsibly source products and contracts. Food, uh, this is very interesting as well because they there are some practices where they change from um, meat to vegan or vegetarian options and uh, meat accounts for uh, I'm not sure about the statistics now but it's a major contribution to uh, methane and, and, and CO2 well mainly methane um, that is contributes more to climate change than CO2 uh, in terms of a gas and then waste management so one Tour, tournament uh, recycled 50% of the waste and donated a surplus uh, to improve awareness among the general public. So in the stadiums, what you, I mean, there are mainly five, I mean, there are five uh, sustainable sport venues or, or these are the five most sustainable sport venues. The Amsterdam Arena, the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, the Levis Stadium, the Golden One Center, and the FIFA World Cup 2022 stadium that uh, is not yet there, but uh, 
we are building it to be the most sustainable one. I mean, you can check this in your own time, but it's very interesting to see that uh, the things the, that are taking into account to reduce carbon emissions <coughs> are energy, well, are usually the same, energy, water, transport, and then uh, there's also food and communications as well. For the Amsterdam Arena, um, you can see the practices here. No, when we talk, uh, talk about energy, we're not talking about uh, only um, switching on and switching off the lights, but we're talking about investing in renewable energy. So here they power by more than 4,200 solar panels and a wind turbine. An energy generating escalator, energy storage system. So as you can see, this deals, deals more with the uh, things that would change in the building itself. Uh, they use rainwater from the stadium roof, collected and reused to water and grass field. And the car park offers free charging points and every visitor is uh, entitled to a discount on train tickets. So that's, that's a good practice. And the Mercedes-Benz Stadium is LED, LEED certi certified. Oh, by the way, um, I, all the references are going to be in the, uh, in the presentation. So if, when you download the presentation, you can see where we took all these references from, all this information from. So again, energy, water, transport, and the Levis Stadium, energy, waste, food, uh, here food is more uh, local food, like sourcing of lo local food rather than uh, using vegetarian or vegan. And this one is in the US. I think they are great fans of, of meat, <laughs> so it's going to be uh, difficult. Um, so the Golden One Center, the same. Uh, Different, different practices, but uh, basically under the same uh, topics. And as I said, the FIFA World Cup is going to, is planned to be a zero carbon tournament. So let's see how this goes. And finally, sports clubs. There's a great uh, um, organization, the, the Forest Green Grovers Football Club that <coughs> it's very interesting because they, for, they uh, organically grow their pitch uh, fed by um, collected rainwater and they use meat-free menus which I think it's, it's great and they are regarded um, as one of the greenest sports organizations uh, as the quote here says uh, forest green growers are using the status of football to showcase that, that it is possible for sports organizations to function under an environmentally responsible operating model. And I found that, that interesting too because um, in the UK they have a list of uh, football uh, sustainably uh, organizations. The Arsenal goes first. Um, <coughs> they give points. So as you see, clean energy, energy efficiency, transport, um, waste management, water. So plant-based, low carbon food, again, and communication and engagement. So, I mean, you have an idea of what, if you want to focus on things, uh, what topics you should uh, probably focus more on. And you, hear, you can here have some examples. Actually, here you have the link and you can check what they are doing to make their sport events more sustainable. And if you want even more examples, you can check the Playing for, for Our Planet guideline. Um, <coughs> here are projects and organizations right now working to uh, make um, events uh, more sustainable. So you can also research in your own time. And if you want to be part of our network, uh, we're going to have another webinar next uh, March. Uh, so if you click uh, to the EU one, you can be part of our network. If you click to uh, the Spanish one, you will receive 
uh, information on the cat in Catalan, Spanish, and English uh, about the webinars as well, and that that we do at least in Spain, and um, and we we will also communicate at the EU level. Um, and for questions, uh, playgreenproject at ecosurveys.net and, and yeah, and just uh, finally I want to mention that this is going to be part of a toolkit that we are going to create. So keep tuned and uh, on our website. So here are the references and thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the partners of this project as well who are working on uh, play green.